Somalia, a hot, dry country. The people of Somalia respect this harsh terrain and sustain life from its meager resources. What seems barren to outsiders, the Somalis regard as a blessed land teeming with camel herds. Somalia belongs to its people. Its pastures are a gift from God to all Somalis. Somalia straddles the Red Sea and Indian Ocean in the northeast corner of Africa. This is the Horn of Africa, the biblical land of frankincense and myrrh at the crossroads of Africa and the Middle East. There are four million Somalis and six million camels in Somalia. Over half of these people are nomads, the rest farmers and city dwellers. It is a country of contrasts. Until 1972, the Somali language was unwritten. But words have always been at the heart of the culture. In a land where breath comes hard and no fresh breezes blow, when daylight comes and the dust rises, the distant roar belongs to the hungry lion and the battle belongs to the valiant. But the scorching flame of heat, it belongs to the parching wind. Somalia is a nation of poets. They use the rhythms of nature and the colors of the land to relate the history of a country often racked by outside forces. In the late 19th century, when European powers partitioned most of Africa, they recognized the Horn of Africa for its strategic importance. So these outsiders staked claims to it, leaving these monuments as stone symbols of a colonial past. In the Horn, Britain, Italy, and France join the ancient African empire of Ethiopia in dividing up vital Somali grazing lands. For Somalia, the time is ripe for someone to lead this nomadic society, suddenly faced with intruders intent on colonizing them. Somalis are a religious people. As Muslims who believe themselves descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, it is fitting that the leader who steps forward is a Muslim teacher named Muhammad Abdullah Hassan. In 1895, Muhammad Abdullah Hassan returns to Somalia from the holy city of Mecca, bringing with him a clear vision of the power of simple faith. He is considered a Sayyid, or Holy One. On arrival, he resists an English officer who has demanded an entry tax. In a struggle, the Englishman falls off the pier. The belligerent Somali is not arrested, but is simply dismissed as being mad. The Said starts denouncing his countrymen who cooperate with such colonial authorities, urging all Somalis to work together as Muslims. If the land is your land, why aren't you its government? If Islam is your religion, why do you submit to infidel overlords? His message inspires many to join him. They become the dervishes, a movement of devout Muslims dedicating their lives to the service of God and community. Their units repel Ethiopian soldiers who have plundered Somali villages. In 1899, the British receive a defiant letter from the Said, challenging their very presence. Now choose for yourselves. If you want war, we accept it. But if you want peace, you must pay us a protective tax. Relations deteriorate. Britain proclaims the Said to be a rebel of the empire. To the imperialist mind, his rejection of colonialism confirms his madness. Said Mohammed is henceforth branded the Mad Mullah. The colonialist armies join together to break his resistance. 
British mount numerous expeditions against the Somali dervishes, mobilizing a multinational force of Asians, Europeans, and other Africans. Both sides suffer heavy casualties. A stalemate results. The mad mullah makes headlines in Britain. The Said addresses an open letter to the English people. I wish to rule my own country and protect my own religion. We have both suffered in battle. I have no forts, no houses, no cultivated fields, no silver or gold for you to take. All you can get from me is war, nothing else. If you wish peace, go away from my country to your own. Said Mohammed's dervish army continues to grow and soon numbers 10,000 men and women, all trained to ride and to shoot. The war-weary Italians and British negotiate a ceasefire with the Said, allowing his dervishes a territory in the interior. They regroup and create councils to advise their guerrilla army and its civilian supporters. In 1910, Britain reluctantly withdraws her forces to the northern coast. Before leaving, arms are distributed to so-called friendly clans, thereby reigniting old rivalries. The British quickly realize their withdrawal was a mistake. They create a camel corps to patrol coastal areas. In 1913, its commander, Captain Richard Corfield, disobeys orders and leads an attack against the dervishes. Corfield is killed, his forces annihilated. Said Mohammed commemorated the dervish victory with a poem. You have died, Corfield, and are no longer in this world. A merciless journey was your portion. In that other world, tell your companions how God tried you, and say how the dervishes were like thunderbolts of a storm, rumbling and roaring. The dervishes abandon their guerrilla tactics, building a network of fortresses to establish the territory of their state. This political strategy makes them immobile. Military roles are reversed. The dervish structures become fixed targets. After World War I, the British vowed to crush the Said's movement quickly and economically. In 1920, a major expedition combining air, ground, and naval forces is dispatched to Africa with the Air Force in command. For the first time in history, air power will determine military strategy. Air Vice Marshal John Gray remembers. In previous encounters with the British, He'd always uh, had the advantage of extreme mobility. He could move about that country so easily and quickly. The aeroplane reversed that, and we had the initiative, which was quite a new thing. The target is the dervish headquarters at Tele. We'd got the Mad Bola bottled up in this fort and uh, bombed it. I think we did probably a fair amount of damage. The Sade curses the planes. Vultures hovering over my head, eager to dip their filthy beaks into my body. Anyway, the Mad Muller was not so easily caught. Uh, he waited for a few days. He, w he watched what uh, was going on around him. He noticed that... Uh, uh, the Camel Corps watered their camels early every morning uh, and their horses. Uh, <coughs> and uh, whilst they were busily engaged in doing this one morning, um, he and uh, about 30 of his head men uh, on ponies escaped out to the other side of the fort and made a dash for it. So that was the end, really, the end of the little war. Though the dervish troops had been dispersed and the forts were left in ruins, that so-called little war had laid the foundation for the modern Somali state and established Said Mohammed as its father. Said Mohammed articulated Somali beliefs with a poetic power that inspired his people. Today, at the National Theater, dervish history is reenacted.
Oga kali le de ali hara dan nobu hanjirai kuma harasi. For Somalis, poetry is a public art, the expression of their culture, valued above all else. At the National Academy, scholars transcribe poetry, stories, and proverbs composed years ago. This project is especially important since Somalia adopted the Latin alphabet for its language just in 1972. Poems which for generations were known only by heart can now be preserved in the written Somali script. That language is also used for public administration, law, and especially education where great changes have occurred in recent years. Despite some opposition within this patriarchal society, many girls now seek formal education. But they still encounter difficulties. Tahabo Farah is a dean at the Somali National University. In the Somali society, it's very important for a woman to get married because it's very difficult for a woman to live as an uh, independent person. There is this pressure and they are not encouraged generally to, you know, be educated. <laughs> Adequate medical care is a problem for all Somalis, men and women alike. This is Benadir Hospital, Somalia's maternity and pediatric center. The government of Somalia has stated its strong commitment to eliminating human affliction. However, in a country with a difficult environment, inadequate nutrition, and insufficient health care, disease is widespread. Dr. Mohamed Wasame is the director of the Banadir Hospital. And the problem for women, like other countries, is women in pregnancy, mostly they are suffering anemia, malnutrition, uh, high blood pressures, and eclampsia. It's a common problem which we have. The infant mortality rate is high. Even though much progress has been made with the help of the doctors of many nationalities who work here and the extent of medical care now reaches beyond city limits, Somalia still faces enormous medical problems. There is an additional dimension to Somalia's medical burden due to an age-old custom which affects all Somali women it is a radical form of female circumcision called infibulation. For centuries, it was accepted as a female initiation rite, performed to assure virginity and fidelity. But it is now recognized how this practice has been used to subjugate women and maintain their subservient role in society. It is now challenged by socially conscious Somali women unwilling to accept submissive roles. Somali men also support this effort. As a father, Abdul Qadir Noor is committed to eliminating this controversial practice. My wife is insisting very much that I must circumcise all my children, and that I will not accept. This is very much a very big, the biggest problem I'm facing from my family, and especially from my wife and my sisters, and I think this is going to be a war that's going to continue for a very long time, but I'm sure I'll win it. Rakia Haji Duale heads the Somali women's organization and has written an important study on infibulation. Without circumcision, the girl will not be accepted by the society. And mothers and grandmothers, out of firm belief on the physical and moral benefits of the operation, 
they, ha they do it on their girls because it's the only thing which can guarantee the girls' economic and social and marriage security. <laughs> The Somali women's organization has begun an education campaign to persuade women to abandon this harmful custom. We don't like forums to criticize or to interfere this uh, female circumcision issue because it's a Somali problem and we are Somalis, we are aware and we know this is a serious problem in our country and we have the ability and we are ready to do something about it. Somalis have a strong sense of themselves as a people. Unlike most African countries, Somalia is a homogeneous nation whose people speak the same language, share the same culture, and practice the same religion. Islam. As Muslims, Somalis say their prayers in Arabic and have used it for centuries when trading with the Middle East. Given their country's membership in the Arab League, Somalis are today also encouraged to learn modern written Arabic. National service is part of the responsibility that every Somali has. Said Mohammed sought to modify the traditional role of women by recruiting them for his dervish army. Young women train as part of their national service, carrying on a dervish tradition. Somalia now seems more willing than most Islamic countries to improve the condition of its women. The Somali capital is Mogadishu, seat of the government led by military men who took power in 1969. Somalia is an underdeveloped country, struggling to shake off the legacy of colonialism. As a country in transition, much about it remains perennial. The fragrant incense sought by Cleopatra is still traded in the markets. <laughs> Nomadic people travel lightly because people on the move have little use for bulky goods. They must carry only what is essential. In a society built on a nomadic culture, the spoken word, the lightest of baggage, has the strongest tradition. <laughs> Radio Mogadishu broadcasts news, politics, and social commentary. Its airwaves regularly carry Somali poetry. Memorable verse from the past and the words of contemporary poets in the tradition of Sayyid Muhammad Abdullah Hassan.
All oral traditions, but especially poetry, are of paramount importance to Somalis. Successful public speaking determines a Somali's ability to explain community issues, to debate politics, to settle disputes, and to mold opinions. <laughs> Poetry teaches Somalis who they are, where they come from, where they are going. It makes them laugh. It helps them remember. More than a refined art, poetry is essential for their cultural survival. The Somali population, as in the days of the dervishes, remains primarily nomadic. Mohammed Musa Awala is project director of the Somali National Range Agency. Nomadic life, in actual fact, is a life that's dictated by the environment. It's very harsh, and it's actually harsher than many people expect, much more harsher than many people think. Hot wind and heat will lick you like a flame charred plants, stumps of burned trees, and columns of dust will greet you. But God, who fills our water ponds, will not make you thirst. Somali nomads travel hundreds of miles each year across extensive rangelands moving from streams and salt pans to sparse pastures. Some vital grazing areas remain, however, within the boundaries of Ethiopia, causing border conflicts and tense relations. In the nomadic camp, men and women must cooperate to survive, but a traditional division of labor persists. Women tend to most household needs. Men herd the camels, which are owned communally. For Somalis, the camel is wealth, the carrier of goods, the provider of life. They drink its milk, eat its meat, use its leather, and sell off surplus animals. Nomads show boundless affection for these generous animals. They chant to encourage their camels to drink at the water hole. They are all here, ready. They belong to us. How splendid and useful they are. And they are standing ready. You will be cooled. Come forward slowly. Put your mouth to it with blessing. It is devoid of evil. Your shriveled bones are now moist and full again. But the wells are just a stop, for nomads must move on in search of vegetation to sustain the herds. Loss of access to even the smallest pastures can be fatal. National boundaries imposed by outsiders are meaningless to a nomadic people. In this society, the camel is the mainstay, linking Somalis of the interior with countrymen in the cities. Livestock is Somalia's main export supplying principally Arab countries with goats, sheep, cattle, and camels. Here in the goat market, lively trading is the order of the day. Goat's meat and mutton are staples. Somalis, as entrepreneurs, are skillful and judicious in the marketplace. Daily life goes on. Somalia, by reason of its location, has been coveted by foreigners. Today, still at war with neighboring Ethiopia over Somali grazing lands, it struggles to resettle half a million refugees displaced by the fighting. Somalia suffers from drought cycles and an unstable environment. Life depends on scarce water. Its millions of camels, goats, and sheep exhaust the land. 
With the oil-rich Middle East nearby, the Horn of Africa, once partitioned by colonialists, is today an object of political and military maneuvering by superpowers. And yet, these hardy, fiercely independent survivors are beholden to no one. The legacy of Said Mohammed lives on in his people, reminding the world never to take them for granted. For as it was said of the dervishes, no one ever broke their spirit. Now you depart through places steeped in heat, but in that scorching heat that parches the throat and sears the flesh, may God in his compassion let you find that great bowed tree that will protect and shade you.